following podcast is a production of Radio Felician, the voice of Felician University of New Jersey and the home of alternative rock done right. Available via iHeartRadio. Tune in, the Radio Felician app, and at RadioFelician.com. Radio Felician University. Welcome to Building Tomorrow's Workforce, a limited-run podcast series from Felician University and higher education and Wall Street business consultant Tim Landers. Discussing the human capital skills that employers are seeking in today's students to be successful in the workforce of tomorrow. Your host is Lou Ruvalo, Executive Director for the Lenke Family Center for Innovation and Professor in the School of Business and Information Sciences at Felician University. Welcome back to another episode of Building Tomorrow's Workforce focused on advancing human capital. Joining us is Greg Skelly, the Executive Director of the Career and Experiential Learning Center here at Felician University. Welcome, Greg. Thank you. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for having me. And and back again with us is Tim Landers as we continue this series. So, Greg, we've actually talked about the concept of of, uh, advancing human capital and the soft skills that create lifelong learning and, and success for people. And we talked about it from an academic perspective of how we prepare students to be successful. But based on some of the polls that are out there between employers and academics, employers don't really feel that the people they're hiring are truly prepared to be impactful in a positive way in the workforce. You deal with employers all the time and try to place students in experiential internships and opportunities. What are you hearing in this in this area? You know, it's interesting. You can go back, you know, to my days working as a talent development specialist, Lou, twenty for 20 years, right? You know, it, it hasn't changed, Lou. So I look at it this way. What they want is a little different. But so I go back and I look at my time as a talent development specialist, right? There's always someone who has the right skills. They have the right degree. I'm sure we had talked about, right? Excellent GPA. Awesome. But, you know, how good are they at working with others, on team projects to really make the people around them better, right? So we have different phrases, right? We talk about human skills. Could be your people skills, right? And so they're looking for, do you have the empathy? So when you see situations happening in your workplace, how proactive are you willing to help make someone better? Are you looking to just hide behind, you know, what's safe for you? As a leader, your number one goal is to make the people around you better. And you don't start as a leader, as a manager. From the moment you walk in that place, Right? When you see someone struggling on the job, do you stay an extra half hour later? Do you take the initiative to pick up the phone? Or you take the easy way out and just text? So the, the lack of human interaction is, 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 is mind-boggling for some employers because they say, look, we can always find a smarter person than you. But when you interviewed, and here's where they first do that check, right? The famous why you. That series of behavioral questions that say, okay, how would you adjust to the situation And tell me why you do it the way that you do it. And so when they start screening you, and as you start doing those initial jobs, you didn't have a lot of them. So you didn't know that those were important, right? Until you got later in life. And so they're saying now by the time you are a junior, senior, you should have had some experiential learning opportunities. You should have been in the culture of the company. You should have seen how we do things here, right? And now tell us, how did you do those things? So the critical thing is experience. Experience for those things is the only remedy to develop that human capital. Excellent. And, and so can you elaborate a little bit more on why the employers from the, the recent Gallup survey don't believe that the people they're hiring really are trained well enough to enter the workforce? I can look at a couple of ways. So we had several recently. Um, one was a large healthcare facilitator, right? And one was supply chain. And their concern was that some of the curriculum that they actually focus on isn't specific to what they actually need today in the workplace, the execution of it, right? Mm -hmm. Theoretically, they say, okay, you seem to be fine, your study skills, but your problem solving, decision making, right? Critical one that they seem to find, because they give them two scenarios. They run through scenario training, um, interview with them, more than just a behavioral. It's okay, make this decision, what would you do? And they're in situation decision making. They seem to be flustered. They seem to be frustrated. So even when the degree is good, the ability to actually implement it without an overemphasis on a little bit more nervousness than even you and I had back in our day to do that, right? So they're wondering, if in the classes, 
Are you bringing faculty, right, who actually have experience in the classroom? Is your faculty, I know at Felicia, we're doing this more and more today. Lou, I've seen what you do with yours. You bring examples. Dr. Um, Finelli in criminal justice. Lou, mm-hmm. almost every other week has professionals in her class, a former FBI agent, mm-hmm. now bringing that in. So it's saying, where do you bring the professionals into it? We're missing that. I can tell that it's real. Is that making sense? Yeah. So what they're saying is we don't see enough of the real life in the implementation <clears throat> of the examples, right? And then how good are we in higher ed of actually showing the why they need to learn that skill, right? I go back to sports analogy, right? Um, these great football coaches, I'm by no means a great football expert, but they'll say to you, hey, how do you deal with the, the modern athlete? They got all the money they want, right? They don't need you. They come out of college, they can say, hey, out of here, right? Remember, that's business. Football's mm-hmm. business. How do you get them? You've been coaching for 30 years. How do you adjust? He goes, here's what they want to know. They may not like it. They just want to know why, right? So the employees want young people who are going to be curious, who are going to ask questions, who don't just say why, almost like a 13-year-old snot nose. They just don't want to do it. (laughs) They want to know why to be better. So they're looking for students who are curious, those who are attentive, those who actually show an, an initiative that doesn't have to be taught. And I'll end it with this, Lou. And I heard this said by someone else, I'm taking no credit. But it's, I think it's, it's, it's one of my employers who's been really good to us here, Felicia and others, has said to me this, Greg, here's the best sign of adulting for us as a company. When we don't have to keep telling you what to do, when you should know what to do already. Mm. So when you actually know what to do, and we have to keep telling you what to do, on things that you've been told what to do, you're not ready to be adulting. And they don't see that. No, that's great. Tim talked to us a little bit in the prior podcast about uh, the analogy of a tree and its leaves that are kind of there and then gone and back, et cetera. But the constant there, you know, so those are the skills that either are or are not in vogue or are done some other way. But the concept of the trunk of the tree and the roots are really what is the perpetuity of that, yes. of that item and that perspective. And when there's no leaves, the tree does different things and it, it re-enhances itself for the next growth spurt. Um, and using that analogy was kind of pretty illustrative in regard to how we can broaden this out. It gives you more opportunity to do other things, more creative things, when some of the easy programmatic type perspective can be addressed by other means. Greg, I, w- I wanted to ask if um, in your experience there's um, an opportunity for a meeting of the mind because up until very recently, uh, colleges and universities have taken their approach to educating their students and they think they're doing a good job. And then we have the employers and the employer surveys uh, suggest that the employers are not very impressed with what colleges and universities are producing. And so I guess on a, on a, on a larger basis, is it is it really the college and university's responsibility to teach the skills that perhaps previous generations learned at home or learned outside of these formal institutions? Or um, is it the responsibility of the university uh, to, to give these, their graduates the skills that are necessary for workforce preparedness? Great question. Um, those that know me well usually don't, I usually will not pick in between, but this one is the right in between. It really is responsibility of both. Let me just, if you wouldn't mind, I mean this seriously. So I was out my last um, position over in Montgomery County in Pennsylvania, which is the largest, um, probably the highest, I think, income per person in the um, in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Pennsylvania is still mo- mainly manufacturing a lot of it, right? Um, you'll find down at Rowan in South Jersey, what they have in common. Rowan worked in with biopharma companies. In Allegheny, which I was working to a lot of work with, they worked with some large oil drilling. Here's the reality. As a university, we're responsible to help them with their first destination location. They need, we need to do that as old schools. And those who recognize that their primary goal is, yes, the education is awesome. The experience is wonderful. But what will you do with that? Will you take the Franciscan heart that you were taught, the skills 
the connections and go in the world and make a difference, right? That is our mission. That is our goal. So it would be like me taking a, my young child, I have two doors now, 22, 25, and get them to 18. It's okay, you're on your own, go. But I never taught them how to engage with the world. We never taught them to, that's our mission. Not to mean that's the business of education. It's the exit of where you go, right? So then the other side is industry. Industry needs talent pipelines. They need good people. Every single workforce development grant I've ever been involved in, and, and by God's grace, that's kind of where I made my transition from high um, from industry to higher ed. I did a lot of industry workforce, uh, uh, federal and state. And here's where they always come to higher ed. Do you have the talent that we will actually spend money on a new wing in your building? Will we'll come to your recruitment events because you have the talent. So they do need us. They do want us, right? Now, the debate on how much should be industry focused, how much should be academic, but you got to understand we need each other. There is no compromise on that, right? And so one of the things I left out, Lou, before was, you know, what's the skills the employers are telling us? Right. I think both sides are off here. Neither one's listening, right? right? Because yeah. if you really listen like we're supposed to, engage listening. Right, like we're, we're not do, doing that. Like, like what we're doing right here. So if we're willing to say, okay, I don't like what they just said. Right? You can still show politeness and manners. But, you know, sometimes it gets hot, though. Right? Conflict that goes towards something that's good is okay. Right. Right? And so industry has a certain culture, has a certain approach, and higher ed has a certain approach. But to, to, I hope I answered the question well enough. But the main gist there is you realize that both sides need each other. And this truly is the chicken and the egg, mm -hmm. which comes first. But I would look from the higher ed part simple. You can't take university and human capital, money in this case, emotion, caring, and then leave them at the altar. Employers can't keep, and again, this is a capitalist who has a socialist heart, right? That's, that's my background. I'm a capitalist, a socialist <laughs> heart. That's I've described myself for 35 years. I love making money. I love industry. I love what we do to help people. Right. And industry can't keep taking and taking and taking and not taking care of the talent that makes them a business, which goes back to the human capital, right. right? So if we just learn to just listen, and guess what? Try it. It may not always work, right? I think the case I talked about with you guys when we were breaking the, the agreement we did with Union County College at the time, now Union College, and with one of the unions, I think it only lasted three or four years after that, and then it dissipated, right? But at least it was a start, right? There's a beginning that needs to at least start. So if they listen and actually willing to put money where their mouth is and prioritize, it's doable. Well, it's wonderful to hear because um, without a, a true partnership, and I don't think there have been, we, we've had relationships, but I don't think it's been a true partnership between the private sector and, and higher ed. But a true partnership is one where both parties have skin in the game. And I heard one wonderful model recently, Lou, I don't think I shared this in our earlier podcast, where a university uh, goes and partners with a private sector company, and then they both exchange personnel. So the corporation mm. will send cool. their workers to become teachers, and the teachers go to the corporation and spend a number of months. So they're both residents and scholars in each other's institutions. And then they come back with a new perspective and a new vantage point to benefit both organizations. That's cool. And I think those are the kind of partnerships and solutions that are really exciting and are going to help address some of the challenges that both employers and um, higher ed are facing at the moment. That would be neat. You know, one of the things that we've seen work, um, even here in New Jersey, right, the, ger the, the, the German model of apprenticeship, right, where the student actually, and we're not talking about additional, you know, skill trades, we're talking about those in maritime. We're talking about those in, you know, in high tech areas where they sponsor, right, with the college. And that person from sophomore year on actually goes three days full time. The other two days they work. And with the understanding that by the time you get done, we're going to hire you. And let's just say something happens. Hey, the student is not, you know, quote, committed like marriage to do it. But that would be the goal, wouldn't it? To know you have mm -hmm. a job that's high paying, that's got growth and skills that you can build. Plus, they pay for your tuition, right? We're doing that in New Jersey. And one of the goals here at Felician is to make that model a piece of the pie, right? So you've got everything from traditional internships, which is basically, okay, maybe 15 weeks. Now, okay, no, you're going to be there for a year. 
right? Now you're talking about, hey, you may be, we have international students. I forget the number, but we have quite a few, and they're coming back. So now they're going to be in their home countries, right? Spending three or four months there, getting more exposure. Again, human side of it, right? And so if we can expand that connection to have them embedded in industry younger, they will see the benefits of the education that we provide. Mm-hmm. They will see how it works daily, right? This, oh, I didn't realize why it was there. I remember having this argument. It was an argument because I'm Irish and I'm a little bit. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I'd be like, hey, I get that you don't want that piece of it. I was on your side for 20 years. But here's what you're not realizing. For them to do that skill, most people don't have this skill. They do learn that in the classroom. They learn that in the lab exercise. Oh, okay. But until we get them to believe that we know what we're talking about, and vice versa. And that's why those kind of internship apprenticeships, any kind of German mob apprenticeships are awesome. And let's be honest, the sooner you get people to work, you know, my dad being one of 13 kids, number nine in the food chain, told us from the get-go, work is the great leveler. Mm-hmm. You learn about life, more about work, and then there's thinking about it. That's well, if true. you think about it, any, any industry, any company we look at, we can define what their business model is. And in most of the normal corporate environments, hospitals, et cetera, their their model is not education. That's ours. And as as an academic institution, to use the word business for what we do is sometimes poo-hooed in that perspective. But we're really trying to turn out productive members of society based on what we feel is the right cadre of 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 exposures and experiences for them. I personally, coming out of industry, and Tim also, I, I think what we're able to do differently in our classrooms is the ability to take the real life experiences that we've witnessed and had and bring them in to an academic setting and use them as a training model. The ability for a company to partner with the institution, like you said, the the German model there, is really a way to say, how do we create this? A, a, A pharmaceutical company should not be the expert at teaching. That's what an academic institution does. And I think it sets up for a wonderful hand and glove relationship, almost a marriage to the, and a successful one that you do what you do best. We do what we do best. And there's a mutual dependency. There's an alliance there to make that work. Building tomorrow's workforce, a limited run podcast series from radio Felician. If I could just, you know, Tim and mentioned before, right. And I think it was, dead on when you talk about that that unity, right, that that agreement. And I know you're hesitant to use the word marriage, but I'll just tell you. So the big part of my job is still to do career counseling, right? For Whether it was for industry and I have grown people always saying, hey, great, my next move. Or now at Felician, I'm working with 1825 and alumni. And I'll tell you all the time, I use dating as the perfect analogy for all of it. I, and again, I watch the fine line. I don't want to know the details, right? I don't really care what the partner is, yeah. but the human side of it, right? Even how you negotiate multiple jobs at one time. What kind of character do you show during that? It doesn't make you a bad person to dance with more than one employer. When you're working on the actual job itself, right? How do you help someone without sounding and being icky? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. My mom used to talk about, like, I like him. He's not icky. Right, so, so so still showed compassion without being so you know you know what I'm talking about right almost like a little skeevy right so so part of our students to understand our grad students those in the science fields right there's always going to be someone with a better GPA than you in in bio <laughs> just is there'll be mm-hmm. someone with a better invention than you where are your people skills demonstrated through human capital working with others that makes them say you know what. There's something about you. You've demonstrated that. And do you have the experiential experiences where I can call a reference? And here's where the ultimate comes. Remember, mama can't brag about you. She ain't going on the interview. Papa can't brag about you. He ain't going. Your partner can't do that, though he Mm -hmm. or she may want to. Those recommendations that you get, those human connections that you get, because ultimately, when you date someone, my wife would be 37 years God bless her. How she's put up with that, I have no idea. <laughs> but here's the critical. Right? Any, any successful relationship goes down to one thing, right? They get me. They get me. So an employer's saying, 
they get us. They may not all of us yet, mm-hmm. but they get me. Am I making sense with that? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so when you know that you pick the right industry, so when you're in a meeting, right? You're an accountant, fine. But do you enjoy talking about the product that you're actually doing financial analysis about? Do you love that you're helping people, maybe with a Catholic, Catholic diocese, right? And you care about young people, and maybe you're working in HR. It's HR. No, it's not. Your product is the young people in Catholic charities. So when you're talking about what does employees want, that's what they want. They want that you love the business of the business, right? And when you don't understand that there's a business to every sector there is, including higher ed, that's the critical where they say they don't get us. It's not going to work. They're just not. And to be a little bit, we've been very, I think, open-ended and very upbeat. But I think a little bit where we have to push our young people a little bit more. There's going to be challenges on every day of your life. When they go through those challenges, it makes them braver for the big ones that matters. Mm -hmm. And when we keep giving them the wonderful support that we've been doing, even things like Suits You here at Felician, where they need clothes for interviews, we have that for them. We have counseling sessions to bring them to, to talk about real life to do that. We've got faculty, Lou, not to embarrass you, like Lou and others, actually hands-on industry piece. They can bring it alive. That is the support that they need. They don't always need, okay, it's okay. No, it's not okay. We know it sucks. It's no good. But here's a way out. Mm -hmm. Again, and then they say to us, and the employer says to us, you get us. Because a lot of times we in industry, we in higher ed, go to industry and say, well, what can we do for you? And the industry automatically shuts their doors down and goes, you don't even know what we do, do you? Hmm. Right? And mm-hmm. on the flip side, the student comes to us and says, you know, Dr. Fellow, I need this. I say, what do you need? Well, I thought you could help me. They don't get it. So knowing what each other makes them tick and knowing that what we connect, that to me is critical in that human kindness, right? In that human capacity. Yeah, and knowing the job to be done is yes. um, not just germane for businesses, but germane for everybody. That's great. So these skills really are no no bounds. They actually permeate in a universal depending on industry. And you can actually kind of mutate or create your career in multiple industries, multiple companies, as long as you get it, as you said, Greg. Absolutely. That's great. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll Thanks, see you on the next Thanks, podcast. Thank you very much, guys. All Thank right. you very much. This podcast has been a production of Radio Felician, the voice of the Franciscan University of New Jersey. Visit us anytime at RadioFelician.com. Want to send an email? Reach out at radiostation at Felician.edu. Radio Felician, the Falcon.